Ruckus Avenue Radio. Hello, I'm Nalini Sharma, and you're listening to Ruckus Avenue Radio. Namaste and hello, Ruckus Avenue Radio listeners. This is your correspondent, Priyadarshini G. Roy. Today, we are live at Dash Radio on Hollywood Boulevard, as you can see with a very special and talented guest, who is not only an actor, but a very versatile comedian, Nalini Sharma. Nalini, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. <laughs> um, it's, as you can see, getting a little cooler in Los Angeles because of us ladies. Um, we're, we're both wearing full <laughs> sleeves, and uh, the heat is kind of subsided, except for in the studio, of course. So mm-hmm. I'm going to give our listeners a little background information about Nalini. So Nalini Sharma has been described as a hilarious, beautiful, obviously, edgy, soulful firecracker by her friends, savage, bougie, classy, ratchet by all her exes, and a giant pain in the <clears throat> by her mother. Mm-hmm. She spent her childhood <laughs> on several naval bases in India. Thank you and your family for your service. And grew up in several small towns in the US. She was raised by an untrained Doberman, has survived more than one motorcycle accident, the pain and joy of a passionate family, don't we all? (laughs) A competitive academic education is currently surviving, not well, comedy open mic nights in Los Angeles. As an actress, she started her career in New York City, where she appeared in several award-winning off-Broadway regional productions. She was a company member of the OB award-winning Flea Theater and has worked with acclaimed directors in film and television, such as Jonathan Deem, Tom Verica, Michael McDonald, and so many more. Nalini, yes. that was not only a mouthful, but that's amazing to have lived it. It took me a couple, uh, a minute or so to just talk about it, but you lived it. That's amazing. Congratulations. I know. I was like, I've never heard that read out loud before, but <laughs> well, epic. That's, that's what it sounds like, a live table read for you guys. How many lives have I had? Wow. No, it seems like multiple, but that's yeah. amazing. So tell us more about your journey. Let's start from the very beginning. Okay. Um, when I was born. Yes, absolutely. When, <laughs> when were you born? I was conceived, <laughs> what my parents were doing. Um, <laughs> no, no one wants to hear that. Um, yeah, I, let's see, when I came here, I was, came here when I was very young and, um, you know, it was kind of a traditional path in the beginning, okay. uh, sciences, through college. Same. Mm Mm-hmm. All that good stuff. Very depressing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Very serious, monotonous, depressing. Yes. Go ahead. I won't interrupt you anymore. No, no, no. (laughs) Uh, Agreed. It was very kind of like, I mean, I was really good at it, but I kind of just was, you know, kind of robotic a little bit. It felt robotic, my life. Um, My mom is an artist. The arts kind of runs in my family also. So my family is kind of both arts and sciences. Wonderful. And um, my mom was a trained dancer, classical dancer, Bharatanatyam, and um, she put me in music, so like Carnatic uh, voice lessons. So since I was young, I've been like singing and dancing. And after college, I took a year off and I went to India to study music. And I studied with the Lalguri family. Um, okay. What Karana like, is that, if you don't mind me asking? They're Carnatic, like South okay. Indian, okay. big classical, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know one of those, Yes, yes. guru type. And I remember I did that for like nine months, Mm -hmm. Um, kind of just, you know, did art like all day long. And I don't know, something just kind of lit up in me. And I was Mm. like, the arts is something I can put in like 150% and it won't even feel like work. Right. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? So um, so that's when I decided to go to New York and um, started doing theater. And I couldn't really pursue music here because I didn't have the same sort of discipline with it. Okay. But at least theater, in terms of resources and everything, I could do it. So that's yes. what started it all in that's New York. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, yeah. so now we're in New York for all of our uh, bi-coastal people listening. Um, so I, um, so I did, there's a downtown theater. I did a lot of downtown theater okay. at the Flea. Um, okay. Uh, with, um, they were called the Bats, um, this like company. Uh, okay. We, you know, the company won a lot of awards and it was really fun. It was run by Jim Simpson and, um, oh my gosh, Alien, uh, Sigourney Weaver. Okay. Yeah. Right. So that was the theater that I kind of like got my chops and my acting chops and, and yeah, I started there downtown. That's wonderful. Okay. Now, since then, have your parents approved of you transition? Like, what was that conversation like? 
Yeah, it was a while back, a little rough right. with my dad mostly, but I think, um, you know, as they are, they're afraid, you know, of the uh, instability. instability. Yes. Yeah, and I will say, like, now that I've kind of grown up a little bit, um, a little. <laughs> haven't, yeah, if you come see my show, you'll see I haven't grown up at all. <laughs> but, um, and it is true, it is a lifestyle of, uh, instability, uncertainty, too. uncertainty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and but I think that um, I love life. I mm. love waking up and not knowing what my day is going to be, mm. and I kind of thrive on that. My creativity thrives on that, and um, and financially, yeah. I mean, things come. You know, things come when you start getting really good at what you do. <laughs> Absolutely. So, what was that like, kind of rebuilding from New York, and then? increasing your network and proving your metal. So tell us about that journey. Yeah, um, that I remember initially was rough. Mm. Uh, when I moved to LA, I know I got like, in terms of work-wise as an actress, I got work commercially, like okay. I got a commercial agent right away. Um, but I kind of didn't know my voice. Okay. You know? It takes some time to like get your footing in, and I can relate to that as an actor-singer as well. Like you yeah. can find... Okay, look, listeners, we're in Los Angeles. There's a bunch of agencies. They yeah. all promise to get you a star <laughs> on Hollywood Boulevard oh where God. we are right now. Totally. So let's not, um, you know, sugarcoat anything, but it's yeah. hard to find someone who's going to advocate for you because for them, typically you're just another name on their roster. Totally. And the thing is, I didn't, I, I'm kind of a rebel. So sometimes whatever like the status quo was, you know, Mm -hmm. when I first got here, I didn't want to do that. I could have taken advantage. Sometimes I look back and I think I could have taken advantage of my beauty more, you know, Mm. kind of played into that. I could have. Like beauty pageants or just just, getting your foot in the door. Getting my foot in the door type of thing, like with modeling or, you know what I mean? All of those things. But Mm -hmm. I am such a friggin' rebel. Good. I didn't want to do that. I just didn't want to. And you know what? It's taken me longer than some of my other maybe counterparts, but I'm so proud of my voice because I really just worked on developing my voice. And it took me longer than I think most like Indian people would be like, ah, I think you failed. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I know I did. I pretty much did for like nine Aww. years. Um, <laughs> you know but what I mean? But isn't that what success is defined by? Multiple failures until you finally hit that sweet spot that works for you. Ugh. And the thing is, I can go to bed at night, like, content. Sound sleep. You know? Yeah. Sound sleep. Truly, truly, I'm being honest, is sound sleep. Because I'm like, I wake up, and I'm doing what I want to do, mm-hmm. and I'm saying the things I want to say, mm-hmm. and I'm standing up for the things I, I value. So what more is there, you know? Absolutely. I think, um, again, it takes a long time. Yes. Okay, cool. Episode 16, Nalini Sharma. We're picking back up from... So it takes a lot longer to do things the right way, as we learned, as women of color in Mm -hmm. entertainment, as proud Indian Americans, it takes a lot longer for us to reach the successful milestone or how some people like to say, breaking the glass ceiling. (laughs) And I think we've seen a lot more metal doors being shut in our faces. Uh We're at the ceiling. Uh We're not even there to look up yet. Um, But I feel like another advice that a lot of people or a lot of celebrities who quote unquote make it give is, oh, just be yourself. But I feel like it takes a decade or so, if not more, to know yourself. Forget to be yourself. I think you have to be comfortable knowing who you are, what you bring to the table, and what you will and will not compromise with. And that's an individual choice. Um, And I'm so so proud of you for sticking to your guns and figuring that on out very early because a lot of women, they come into entertainment not knowing those things. Mm -hmm. And it's not the safest place for you mentally, Mm -hmm. forget other aspects of physical safety and whatever else is required, but just for your mental health, it's important to know where you stand with your choices. So Mm -hmm. have you had to let go of some, you know, great opportunities just to stick to your metal? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, totally. I think just, 
you know, sometimes you can kind of get lost in that journey. You know what I mean? Like, oh, what am I supposed to be doing as to what do I want to do? Right. And I think like, um, I think that was the thing. I mean, you know, I've been approached by like, you know, skeezy producers and oh, yeah. whatnot. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's a hard no. <laughs> you know I think what it's I mean? Easy no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an, oh, a hard no meaning like a, stern a big, no. a stern, a stern no. no. That's like, right. Yeah. Easy that no. Words. That's right. That's so true. Thank you for uh, correcting that. Uh, easy no and a stern no um, in capital letters. Um, mm-hmm. And then I think, yeah, I, I feel like um, in that sense, it was kind of, yeah, finding my way. I did. I, fu- I found my way. And like also like kind of building your spine, you know, in this industry. That took me a while, too. And the point that you made about like be yourself, oh, 100 percent, because, you know, who who knows who they are? You it's, know what I mean? And it's not like you wake up and like, oh, I, I, know, I know what I am. Yeah. And it's, it's life. <laughs> How do you really know without going through the trials and tribulations and the hardships? You don't know through rainbows and flowers, right? Yeah. You learn through the hardness of what you're worth and what yeah. you're capable of. And if you have the mental stamina to take on rejection on a daily basis yeah. as women. And I feel like even the roles that we were being offered 10 years ago, I know we are very proud of the fact we talk about inclusion now and seeing a lot mm-hmm. of Indian faces on mm-hmm. mainstream media. Mm-hmm. And we, how do you feel about that? Like you've worked with a lot of great executives, like mm-hmm. going back to some of Nali's accomplishments, so as a writer, she moved to Los Angeles and she was hand selected by the legendary Steve Martin for his comedy writing masterclass. She wrote Birdie and Blanche, a series that was a finalist for 2016 Sundance New Voices Lab. And she was selected to be a performer writer for the CBS Comedy Showcase in 2018. Mm-hmm. So before I go into the other amazing aspects that you've done, what is it like <laughs> to work with these big networks and how did you advocate for yourself? Um, yeah, I mean, the CBS showcase was a great, great experience for that, um, to really learn how to stand up for yourself and your voice and, you know, your cause it's a very like kind of high pressure system environment and you're kind of pitching ideas to execs all the time. Mm-hmm. And, um, so yeah, that really, really kind of almost helped me build my spine. It was, it was kind of a, kind of a turning point actually with my stuff. Um, and, uh, and really, really grounding yourself. And sometimes, you know, you have those days where you're like, I'm just going to have to do a blind faith thing today. You know what I mean? Sometimes you could rehearse everything to the T, dot your I's and uh, cross your T's. But then when you get there, something else just takes over. Yes. And it's, some people call it fate, luck, destiny, whatever happens. I think it's just like a natural like ascension of like something takes over and you either hit or you miss. Yeah. Yeah, truly. And I think it is, it is that it's just like, you know what? I trust that if I'm on stage or on set that I focus on what I'm doing in the scene, you know, or if it's comedy, it's, you know, my own material. Um, and I just focus on me and one other person in the audience, you know, that I'm just doing it for one person or I'm doing it for, mostly it's for myself. Like, Mm -hmm. hey, can I live in this character for the Mm. next 60 minutes? Can Mm -hmm. I live in this uh, world for the next 60 minutes? Let me take someone on a ride. Mm. You know what I mean? Just one person, instead of thinking about the big picture pressure stuff, you know, then that, that puts you in your head and then you're kind of screwed. So, (laughs) (laughs) but if you just sort of focus, you know, it's meditative, it's pretty trance-like performing, which is why I think so many of us are so addicted to it. Um, It's a different high altogether. Yeah, it's such a wonderful high. Like, because you really are, your job as a performer, writer, creator, artist is to transport people into a different world, into your world. And that's your job and you owe it to them. You know? Absolutely. So it's funny you mentioned the word transport because I'm getting my PhD in strategic media. Oh, and, uh, congratulations. Kind of, thank you. It's, it's a lot of hard work. It <laughs> sounds great, but it's a lot of hard work. Um, I bet. And one of the communication theories that we study, and it's one of the, my focuses of my dissertation, is called the transportation theory. Mm. And it pertains to media and any type of storytelling is that 
when you're orating a story or yeah. when you're singing a song or whether you're doing stand-up comedy, any type of storytelling, reading a book, showing mm-hmm. a movie, you are transporting audiences mentally and emotionally while their physical presence is in at home mm-hmm. or in a theater or mm-hmm. you know sitting in the audience. Yeah. And you're transporting them to your story world. Totally. So it mm-hmm. is basically you are the driver yeah, and you're guiding them to a certain direction and yes. where that lands and where that resonates with audiences. It's, it's all a part of that journey and that process. Oh uh, yeah. And that is the stuff that excites me. Like just now, just ta- you here, like talking about that, that's, this is why I'm an artist. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I get off on this stuff. Like yeah, <laughs> to me, absolutely. every piece I do, even, even if you're like, you know, it's a joke, Right. If you're writing a joke, a joke in a full sentence is a transport. It's you're transporting them into that world and you're setting them up and then you make them laugh. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, Piece of music, whatever it is. Oh, my gosh. I gosh, I freaking love that stuff. It's so fun for me. <laughs> I'm glad. And I think if you have a passion for it, that propels you to overcome all the obstacles and like the bureaucratic issues that you may come up yeah. with working with bigger networks. And speaking to writing, you write your own skits for comedy. Mm-hmm. What have you seen so far that's come your way as an actor in terms of writing? What do you think the level mm-hmm. of writing is for Indians, women of color, yeah. et cetera, et cetera? You know what? I'm actually recently, I've been, um, and this is a conversation that I've also had with my, you know, my wonderful reps who totally get me and okay. they've been to my solo show and they're like, Oh my God. And they, they totally get who I am as a person. Okay. And some of the parts that I've read for recently, I mean, they're really cool. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. They're good. really cool. Great parts and just complex, you know, okay. funny. They're not one dimensional characters from a piece of paper. Yes. <laughs> it's not, you know, I'm not the assistant. You know yes. what I mean? I'm not like someone's sidekick. I'm not, you know. The hot girlfriend. I'm not yeah. the hot girlfriend. Although I'm not even bell. like. <laughs> I will, I'd like to be the hot girlfriend in real life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, listeners, whoever's listening, listeners, check out Nari online. Oh, shit. No, my DMs are going to blow up. <laughs> be like, yo, girl, I heard you were single. Um. <laughs> be like, yeah, you should come check me out on my show and then bounce. Yeah. <laughs> Oh no, <laughs> pandering, pandering. Um, yeah, I yeah, they've been really, really cool parts. So I mean, it's a matter of which one will land for me. Um, mm-hmm. But I, you know, I love like dark comedy. I love, and some of my writer friends from the improv world are actually now become execs, and oh, they're also writing incredible, incredible stuff for TV and for women of color. No, I I believe that's where the next level of transcendence comes when it comes to our stories that growing up, we could never relate to things watching it on television other than Bollywood films. Yeah. And that was our uh, resonating piece that kind of struck home. Mm -hmm. But now I see a lot more of Indian culture. You see it, whether it's on Food Network or social media, Mm -hmm. or now you have a lot of hit series that are coming on. But sometimes I wonder... Are we still winning if it's just Daisy's hiring Daisy's? Mm, I mean, that's a great point. Um, yeah, I mean, there's work to do there. <laughs> I feel like we're on that path, and this yeah. is not a right or wrong, but at the end of the day, it takes people of color to be put in executive positions of writing, mm-hmm. of storytelling, of producing, of directing behind mm-hmm. the scenes behind the camera so that the people in camera what can be represented equally across all spectrums Mm -hmm. we speak about our background as indians but also there's so many other different cultures that need to be represented Mm -hmm. and i think it's the advocacy that indian americans have done across all different spectrums whether that's in medicine like your family is from a science background Mm -hmm. or through business or through any of the industries where we are the global ambassadors for what indian representation looks like outside of india And I think media only facilitates that story. Now, my point of argument is I see a lot of these shows kind of curtail to more Americanized versions of what Indians are. Right. And therefore, I can't always connect to it. So now I personally am in this dilemma of, you know, growing up watching a Disney show and I'm like, okay, well, you know, we're not allowed to date in high school. So what am I supposed to like watch this for? And, Mm. you know, all those things that you see, it's like a dual life and you see your internal and your external world. 
And now I see a lot of these shows talking about like they sees in high school. I'm doing all those things. Mm-hmm. And I wonder like when I see like younger cousins are still, it was always for us a hush, hush down low. Like obviously people are having lives. We're just not openly discussing them. Yeah. Or it's like, oh gosh, how do I cover for this cousin? Or like it's always <laughs> an alibi or like you're changing your outfits. Or like, It's always this type of yeah. um Sadly, sadly. I'm studying. <laughs> quote We're going to the library. Yeah, I'm at the library, Dad. Um. No, sadly, I, I that was me. I was literally at the library because I was a pre-med student yeah. uh, in college. And so we had a fifth floor, five floor library in my <laughs> undergrad. And yeah, sadly, that was that was I me. know. And you know what's sad is like my moves are like all like <laughs> academia related. <laughs> I only know how to hit on them. It's like, oh, do you want to? study together <laughs> and they're like what no you want to just go to happy hour i'm like oh yeah i mean yeah we could do that well, yeah like, like i said anything. now you can plug in your show and be like oh yeah i uh wrote and uh, <laughs> act on my own comedy skit so maybe you should get That's drinks right. after you attend my show but tell yeah. us more about your show and yeah. where audiences can buy tickets where we can check it out and tell mm-hmm. us what, what inspired you to make that solo show anyway oh yeah um so in the pandemic uh when the pandemic hit i sort of artistically died um, (laughs) inside Uh, and this you know I'm open about it because it's truth and 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 there's no you know there's no shame to there's no shame yeah Um, it's just what happened to me and um, I have been improvising in town for a while and I started my friend uh, told me about this thing called clowning (laughs) <laughs> this thing it is kind of feels like a thing um and it's this you know comes from commedia dell'arte lineage you know in a uh, long long time ago at sort of the origins of comedy and it's improv without the fourth wall essentially and it's very vulnerable work and it's um and so i did like one clowning show i kind of just threw myself in the fire and i have never felt so free in Aww. my life and i was like you know what this is, this is, I think, for me. And um, because it really is connecting to the audience. And so I ended up actually going to France and I studied with a master clown. Um, his name is Golier. Wow. I wish I could go to France and yeah. study with a clown. But it was pretty so, wild. <laughs> sorry to interrupt you, but please define what the clown means in terms of comedic um, terms yes. so that audiences are aware of what that totally. means. It's not a real Halloween clown. I know Halloween yeah, was yesterday, but yeah. we're not referring to uh, the circus clown. I know. It's not um, Ronald McDonald. It's not Whiteface. Um, it's, uh, it's more, um, it really is just sort of being more vulnerable. There's no fourth wall. So when we are improvising as clowns, the audience is part of the show. Um, it's really fun and it's wild. It's just wild. You can go wherever you want to go. And um, especially actually for South Asians and South Asian women, I, I highly, I always tell my friends, do it. Take a class, do it. It's so freeing. It's so empowering because you own everything that you're doing on that stage. Um, and so, yeah, this master clown, the French, uh, this guy is really good. And I wanted to take learn, his, learn yeah. from him before he, apprentice. before he dies. Oh gosh. <laughs> He's old. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think I was like maybe one other, uh, Desi person in that, uh, school. It was really great. And, um, and then when I came back, I started clowning. And when I was actually in Paris, I, there was a I want, I've always wanted to tell a story about my childhood um, because I spent a lot of time in hospitals. Um, mm, sorry. Uh, yeah, and now it's funny. Uh, <laughs> um, and you know how when you're a kid, you can you remember moments or you remember feelings. You remember just like you absorb things when you're yeah, younger. Yeah, but it's never like a full on story, right? It's never like this happened then this happened. So I could never figure out, you know, because I write in all forms. I write plays, TV, and movies, I could never figure out what form it fit in. But then when I started clowning, I was like, oh my God, this is the world I could explore my childhood with. Oh, wow. And um, because it's playful, Mm -hmm. it's wild, it's transporting you into a different world. So I basically take the audience into a hospital Mm -hmm. um, where I spent so many days and sometimes months and, you know, 
had to use my imagination to just get to through transport it. yourself. And get <laughs> yeah, been there, get through it, and um, and that was that. And I had the idea there in France, and then when I came home, I was like, I put it on its feet, started developing it, and then I did a mini workshop in June, and it was went really well. Good. And then now I'm going to do it at the Elysian. So big stuff. Yeah. <laughs> big yeah. 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 From the hospital to the Elysian. <laughs> That's exactly. wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. So tell our Ruckus Avenue radio listeners where they can buy tickets to your show, the name of this show. We know how it got inspired, but mm-hmm. where can we find it? Um, great. You can go to the Elysian Theater in Los Angeles. And the show is called Until Death by Nalini Sharma. That's wonderful. And it's Sunday, November 20th, and Monday, November 21st. Awesome. Okay. Nalini. That was my car parking, I think. <laughs> oh, we're, welcome to LA. Yeah. So before she goes to fix her car parking, please tell us where our listeners can find you online, your social media. You already told us where we can buy tickets, but where mm-hmm. can they connect with you otherwise? Yeah. And my ticket links is up on, I'm most active on IG, the gram. Um, and you can Slide find- Slide in her DMs. Yes, do it. Um, I'll probably check it in a few months. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, um, it's Nalls Barkley, N A L S B A R K L E Y. <laughs> play on Nalls Barkley. Yes, it is. And uh, yeah, Nalani Sharma uh, on IG. That's the best way. Best way to follow everything. I post everything on there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nalani, for sharing your journey and your story Yay. with us. As we're all excited to see where you take this uh, comedy show yeah. and the clowning. And we wish you all the best for your future endeavors. And we look forward to catching you somewhere on stage. Yes. And on TV. And on TV. <laughs> and on the gram. And on the gram. All right. Thank, thank you so much. You were wonderful. Oh, thank you. Likewise. <laughs> all right. Ruckus Avenue radio listeners, this is Priya Darshini G. Roy, your radio correspondent, signing off with Nalani Sharma. All right, take care until next time. Ruckus Avenue Radio.